the experiences recorded there of the followers of Jesus. Uh, when we last spoke and, and had that discussion with Justin Bass, you know, you, you, you explained that you do believe in the resurrection, but not necessarily uh, in a sort of very physical flesh and blood resurrection, <laughs> necessarily. Um, necessarily. I may okay. be putting words in your mouth. Anyway, but the point being that I, it made me wonder, well, I wonder if Dale's research in these sorts of experiences makes him think that that might be more akin to what the disciples had experienced some kind of grief hallucination or vision where, where do you go with that okay so, so so when you use the word hallucination or grief vision most people understand you to be talking about pure subjective projection so one of the things mm. that i have trouble with is i do not believe that all visionary experiences are totally endogenous i do not believe they're all, that all of them are purely subjective. I think it's possible to come into contact with external realities through mm. visions, all right? Mm. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is I'm not a reductionist at all, and I certainly nowhere say, okay, here's what I know about grief visions, and this explains everything about early Christianity. <laughs> that's not true. For one thing, I, I, they don't give the category of resurrection. For another thing, I think the tomb was probably empty. And I think mm. this has an important uh, effect in how to, to understand mm. what's going on, uh, on in the early church. But has this affected me? The answer is yes, it's undeniable. And part of the reason, I don't think I wrote about this in this book, but I have written about it elsewhere. I did have a very, very dear friend die Mm. And three days after her death, she, I, I don't know how to put this into words, but she woke me up. I was asleep. She woke me up. She was standing at the end of my bed. And she did not say anything. Unlike Jesus, she didn't say anything. Mm. But I do remember thinking at the time, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And whoever is in this state would be the most beautiful thing I've mm. ever seen. It was a very... Uh, encouraging, edifying uh, uh, few moments for me. Mm. Um, mm. I also have to say that when my father died, I had no contact. I didn't see him, hear mm. him. But I got. I had a story from my wife. I had a story from my six-year-old son. I had a story from my brother. I had a story from my mother. I had a story from a friend. Uh, they just lined up to tell me about their post-mortem <laughs> encounters with Clifford. And uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. And, you know, I, I could quiz a couple of these people in great detail uh, about what happened right after it happened. And... It, it's hard for me, I must con confess, it's hard for me to think that they were all just independently hallucinating something. I'm inclined to think that my post-mortem father for a few days was really active and had a lot of things he, he, he needed to um, deal with. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.